Hey, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Hey, and thanks, Michael, for the uh, quick sound check beforehand. And hey, to Laura out there from in Albuquerque. Hey, we are higher ground bluegrass, at least three fifths of us. Uh, Duke Weddington on the banjo, Pat Mahoney on the fiddle, Fred Bolton on guitar, Laura Leach Devlin, our bassist extraordinaire, uh, couldn't be with us today. And, and her uh, other half, Laura's the better half of the pair, but we, we love them both. Uh, Dave Mostly. Devlin on Manlin and Toe Pro. <laughs> anyway, uh, higher ground, who are we? Well, we've been around since 1998. This is our 22nd year. Just like everybody else, it's been kind of a, uh, I would say, a sparse year as it's, far as gigging goes. Surreal. We had a, a really nice uh, Valentine's Day performance up in, uh, up in White Rock back in February. And uh, we, little did we know at the time that uh, that was going to be pretty much our only live performance in front of people. It was like uh, a Don McLean moment in retrospect, wasn't it? Yeah. The day the music died. The day yeah, the music died. Yeah, no Absolutely. kidding. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you to uh, Ron Hale and, and the folks at the Trad Fest for not only having us as part of the uh, festival, some of our videos, you'll get to see those later uh, during the performance portion of the festival, uh, but he asked us to do a, uh, a workshop with you. And we've done them over the years. We've done different ones. We've done vocal harmonies before. Uh, Again, live, we've done fiddle workshops, banjo, sure. banjo and fiddle, rhythm, guitar. Uh, and this one today we thought we'd throw at you is a song arrangement uh, and talk about some of the songs we do and some of the decision-making processes we go into um, on why we do what we do when we do it uh, in any given song. And Laura, I know you're not with us live, but if you've got comments or things you want to throw out, chat them out to Eric and uh, he can interrupt us and uh, throw in his two cents or your two cents from, uh, from down in Albuquerque and, uh, and we'll incorporate that. We're coming to you today. Today, believe it or not, I believe is National Worldwide Pick on the Porch Day. So as it turns out, we are on Pat's Picking Porch. My porch. Yep. Up at about 8,000 feet up in the Hamas Mountains. And as you can see behind us, it's a, it's a beautiful day up here. So anyway, higher ground. What do we do? We do original, traditional, and contemporary bluegrass. Uh, over the years, we've produced eight albums. Um, seven of those have been filled with uh, a lot of original material. We did uh, our fourth album back in uh, 2000, what was that, 13? 12 or 13. 12 or 13. Laura's showing me a picture of something. <laughs> play music on the port. There it is. Yeah, National Play Music on the oh, Porch. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, we did a, an album called Classics in which we did all covers on that. Uh, uh, the traditional ones we've all been playing since we were, we were kids. So uh, at any rate, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll just start with a, a song uh, that uh, we, we did it as a sound check. So Michael, you'll get a little bit more of this one. Uh, it's, a, it's a cover. Uh, it's one that we learned as a kid, or I learned as a kid back in the... Uh, uh, early 1970s came off an old album that was just passed along to me. Uh, we'll start with uh, with that. Uh, and the reason I want to start with it is, that, well, you, you, you need to hear some music, right? You don't need to hear me talk or Pat talk or Fred talk for 45 minutes. <laughs> so we'll play it. Yeah, I know. Laura's going, yeah, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Got it. Uh, but what's unique about this song is we pretty much play it the way it was done on the record. But one of the, the, the things we did to this song, and I don't think we did it until what we've been playing, I've been playing it for over 40 years, is we wrote our own, I wrote our own verse to, uh, our own verse to it, wrote a new verse to integrate and extend it to the song. And we'll do that. Uh, and I think that's true of a lot of the songs we do is we set an original arrangement, but they're, they're truly live songs and that if we think of something later and we think it's going to add to the song, we'll try it. And if it looks like, oh my gosh, that's great. Let's let's put that in there. We'll add it. And that's what we've done with a lot of songs through through the years is you, there's an evolution in from when you originally hear us do them to now. And especially on our recordings, you uh, put them on the CD. And then later on, when you listen to them, you go, oh, we do that so much different. <laughs> so so you're yeah. gonna hear, you'll hear that with uh, a lot of what we do. And... Uh, we have so much fun with the original songs that we all write. It's, uh, I think that's what's fun about this band is, uh, and we can help folks with that is, um, 
kind of how to arrange, you get a basic arrangement. So we'll, we'll uh, yeah, we'll do this one for you. It, uh, it, it is a cover again, but we took it and made it our own. And that's something you want to think about when you do a cover song and you arrange it. You can either do it as a tribute to somebody and do it the way they did it and record it, or you can add a twist to it or add something new. And in this case, we added something new, which is our own verse. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> missing our basis on that one at the very end what? laura's got the pickup line that takes us out she does it perfectly every, every time, time. <laughs> so did you text that laura that said boom 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 you should have texted that. <laughs> yeah okay so that was make me a palette on my, on your floor uh it's a cover that we've done uh you'll notice throughout that that song there's different dynamics that go on from start to finish right the banjo kicks it and then we actually start the song with a chorus and then it rolls right into a verse and then another course. And then we go into breaks, right? Somebody takes a break. The nice thing about that song is there's only 
one portion. It's basically an A portion. You play it for the A part mm -hmm. and you play it for the B part, which is the chorus. Uh, so we play it pretty straightforward. Now, some of the dynamics that we do in that song that I think helped really have made it our own, as you'll notice on the third verse, when I when we go into uh, these blues is everywhere I see. No, it's not proper English, but I am from North Carolina. So it's proper for North Carolina. <laughs> anyway, these blues is everywhere I see. If you notice, Pat and Fred both come in and sing harmony on that. Adds yet something new and dynamic to that. Uh, and then in the, in the uh, fourth verse, the one that we wrote to kind of make it our own, one of the dynamics that Fred added in that one day, it was just at a gig. Unbidden. It didn't even <laughs> ask him to do it. And he just jumped in and sang uh, harmony on the first two lines uh, of that fourth verse. And it just worked really, really well uh, and fit just fine. So that's a, a way we've taken a cover and, and sort of turn that into our own song is uh, the ideas of everyone, right? W nobody in the band, uh, we, we don't view each song as being stovepipe as there's only one way to play it. We, we rely on everybody uh, to provide their thoughts on it, um, on what we should do and when we should do it. Obviously the basic parts of a song, obviously, is there's the start, <laughs> right? Then, then you've got the, it's uh, very important to start. Now starts, everybody needs to start at the same time, right? That's the first important thing. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. yeah we, Mars nod her head on that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> start, basically, then you have the rhythm section, right? You have the rhythm section, which consists not only of the guitar. There are songs where the guitar is not the only one carrying the, the rhythm uh, portion of the, of the song. You got the downbeat typically being carried by the bass, as you would, and then you've got the backbeat. Uh, in bluegrass songs, that is kind of the core trio or triad of uh, elements that you need to have that steady, steady pounding, driving song, right? Lauren, you grinning. <laughs> so the rhythm section is really important. One of the things that we like to do, um, really want to hear that backbeat really want to hear it. So we really make an effort that somebody is always doing the backbeat. Okay. So we have a good start. We get into the song itself, find the groove of a song. Sometimes songs can find the groove themselves. Sometimes you gotta, they need help. They need a little help. A little help. And even beyond the general rule of uh, where the mandolin is, you know, with, with uh, bluegrass, there's the boom chick and it's the bass has got the, Boom, and then the mandolin's got the chick, you know, and it's uh, generally. But then generally. when the mandolin's taking a lead, fiddle being in the same register will generally pick up that. But then there's other, other rules that I just kind of what I do in a song is when we do um, uh, On a Gravel Road, which you'll get to hear today, one of our, when uh, our videos come out. Duke actually takes mandolin and then there's a dobro. So what I usually do is I'll play, I'll do my drawing and everything else in the background <laughs> behind the dobro and uh, chunking when Duke has taken his lead on the, the song. So you try to find, but that's general rules. You can, you have to listen. And it's, I think it's good to record your songs as a band when you're first starting uh, listen to everybody's blend. You want to be able to hear everyone. And the, the mistake of a lot of new bands is creating what I call the wall of sound. Everybody wants to be the lead and be recognized. So it's, uh, it's better to stand back and listen to where you're needed. And uh, instead of everybody playing at once, creating this big wall, because then there's no way to be dynamic. And you'll get to hear... Pay attention when you're listening to our videos. I think that's really, you'll get to see um, the lead guy, the lead person, whether it's Dave or me or Duke, will get really quiet and the rest of the band will follow. Even Laura will follow. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, everybody knows you follow the bass player, right? Isn't that, isn't that that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and Pat makes a really good point there is, you got five instruments and you don't need five instruments banging away all the time. Otherwise you get what, what I like to call is note vomit. You got 
too much going on like and it just makes a mess. So as we said, we've got the rhythm, we've got the downbeat and the backbeat. So the backbeat is really important. Whoever is doing that uh, on songs that I sing lead, for instance, I tend to basically go to a rhythm pattern on the banjo and just get out of the way, keep it out of the way of the vocals and let Dave and Pat, Dave on mandolin, Pat on the fiddle, Mm -hmm. alternate when they will provide fills right in, in certain parts of a song you know in between verses or sometimes at the end of a verse the end of a chorus you need a little fill but they will allow them to be uh, provide the backbeat in an alternating fashion a lot of that is in is it becomes very instinctive in this group you know fred and dave and i have been together 21 of the 22 years so on stage, if we've never played anything, I can look at Dave and, and I know what he's going to do on a song. Uh, and he knows vice versa, a little wink, nod or, or whatever. Uh, and he can direct me to do that. Pat's been with this band now for 10 of those 22 years. And we have developed the same thing as well. So whenever you see Dave and when you see some of our videos and he's playing something on the mandolin, you're probably going to see Pat and I doubling on the back backbeat, right? Because mm -hmm. we're getting out of Dave's way. You don't need to hear the banjo. Dave never wants to hear the banjo. <laughs> but <laughs> Dave, by the way, has always said that Dobro was created to get rid of the banjo once and for all, but it still hasn't attained that goal. So anyway, Pat and I will we'll double up on the backbeat to get out of Dave's way. So a lot of it is who's who's singing lead on the, on the vocal songs and as to what they're doing with their instrument. I tend to just go very simple, very basic and get out of the way and let Dave and, and Pat carry the instrumental portions uh, when we do, do that. Okay. These guys have been talking a lot about other instruments carrying a backbeat, the back chop, but um, you, you heard on, on this tune that we just played, uh, I'm playing a lot of... Yeah, but I can't find, I can't find so sound. There's a lot, of, a lot of backbeat chop Probably on the guitar, right? on the guitar as well. We had a couple that Duke in, in recording said, I didn't know you were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk a little bit, Fred, about how you come up with the way you want to play the rhythm guitar on a specific, any given song. Well, I mean, we, we do the- With some difficulty. We got three quarter tunes, we got six, eight tunes, we got two four, we got four four. Yeah. All of those, those different ones. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of difference too, whether uh, a lot of them we're doing in standard tuning, but you know, occasionally I'll go into dead gad tuning Duke writes a lot of Celtic flavored stuff and and um, and I played Celtic stuff for about 25 or 30 years so um, yeah so you know stuff like uh, you know where you're throwing the, the backbeat chop into the something like that Right, so you, stuff like that. The guitar is doing the boom chunk, yeah. you know, as well. It's just he's covering a different tone range than what the bass is providing, right. or typically the backbeat that we get out of the mandolin, which is typically a high. Pitch, the same yeah. thing as yeah. on the yeah. violin, same uh, relative octave scale. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice too, for instance, when you see me doing it, I, I, I don't rarely, I rarely go into a lot of chords and, and vamping, which is a common style in the banjo. I will more come up and mute and just do a rake across the strings to give that same uh, consistent kind of backbeat uh, on a specific song. The really important thing though about uh, any song arrangement is, is, is truly understanding what you want e each instrument to do, uh, decide what that is, uh, and then stick to it. Uh, it's very important part of developing your sound, right? Th there are so many wonderful bands out there uh, and, and I can just hear it and I immediately know I, before the first word is so, sung or even if it's new material, I can go, that's blue highway. Mm -hmm. I know that. Absolutely. Uh, when you listen to bands like, uh, Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver, Doyle has been running his own band for 40 some years. Yep. And though the players swap out, he has a very distinct sound. And whenever a band, uh, something comes on Sirius XM, that's, uh, you know, I can immediately go, that's Doyle, before they even open their mouths. Uh, same thing with uh, Special Consensus. We saw them 
couple years back, I guess it was about two years ago, they came in through Albuquerque and I spent some time chatting with Greg uh, Cahill there. Uh, and what really impressed me about that band is not only did they have a really tight and sound and they, with only four of them, and they really complemented each other real well, but the arrangements of their songs was very similar to the approach we take, which is don't step on the other, other people, never step on a vocal, for instance, never step on the vocal by playing or noodling when that's going on. Uh, don't step on somebody else's break. Uh, but with special consensus, what really struck me that day is they were so crisp on their starts, uh, the dynamics of the song, if they had something in the middle where there was a quick stop or a pause, um, and then their endings, and everything was just really, really crisp. So with that, you got to be bold, right? You got to go in fearless and, and really focus, and of course, practice. <laughs> One of only three things that help, right? Yeah, yeah. Practice, practice, practice. 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 So tonight, when you're, uh, or this afternoon, when they, uh, the video performances that will be aired of, uh, from uh, Higher Ground Bluegrass, they were actually done last November. Uh, we did them up at the Black Rose Acoustic Society up in uh, Colorado Springs, up in the Black Forest. Uh, great little big old log cabin out there. And they really did a nice job, high definition video, did a great job with the sound. And you're gonna see those tonight. And the, the songs you're gonna see are, there's a total of five, three of them are originals. Um, and then two at the end are traditional and covers. But what I would invite you to do is, uh, you know, we got more things we're going to try to get through here um, on these songs. But as those songs are, are uh, un unfolding and as you're watching them, look at who's doing what when. Not only the, the movement in and out of the microphone, that obviously gives you signals or cues as to who's going to do what. But, but just watch the dynamics of each song because we, we spend a lot of time focused on arranging those things for a specific purpose. Uh, and you'll notice on the very first one, I'm not playing the banjo, I'm playing the mandolin because it's a song that quite honestly doesn't need a banjo. Banjo doesn't add anything new to it. It's it's just a nice, easy groove that a mandolin with that steady backbeat is really what was needed in that song. But look at what we're doing when the music comes in, when it goes out, uh, and really pay attention to that. Um, that the first song you're, you're going to hear is, is uh, on a gravel road, one that Pat and I uh, wrote. Uh, it's really a cool tune. The second tune you're going to hear tonight, uh, this afternoon, is one that the, the she's no longer the reigning queen of bluegrass. The former reigning. Queen. She had it for a year, won the New Mexico Music Award in 2019. For Actually, it was more like 15 months. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. You had an extended reign. I had the extended <laughs> reign. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a very regal queen you were. <laughs> but, but Laura wrote a song about the Yarnell Fire, which uh, June 30th, 2013, uh, we lost the Granite Mountain Hot Shots in a, a Yarnell Hill Fire in Arizona. And she wrote a really great song that tells the story uh, of that. Uh, watch the dynamics of the song uh, from the beginning just watch what happens, all right? The banjo is going to kick it. The most important instrument in the bluegrass <laughs> band. Okay, maybe not. Uh, but then watch what happens. And, and you'll notice, too, that we don't do always do three-part harmony on every song. Not every song requires it. Sometimes a song doesn't require any harmonies. Sometimes two are enough. Sometimes three really is, is what's required. Um, but in Tinderbox, watch it and who's doing what, when, and then how we take it out as well. Uh, there's some really neat and nice dynamics uh, and arrangement elements that uh, in that song. And then the third video you'll see is kind of our trilogy of how we take out, uh, close out our sets. And it starts with Dave, an original instrumental that Dave Devlin, our mandolin and dobro player wrote called Route 127. Uh, but even in that song uh, uh, alone, there's some really, uh, they're cool. There's some cool dynamics and changes of tempos and rhythms and patterns. Uh, and not only the chord progression itself, which is cool, but uh, watch for that. And then after that, just watch how we flow. Uh, it, it unfolds. You'll get to see uh, the trilogy kind of come together uh, all at once.
And then the other thing, our show is uh, done around one mic, which is gaining popularity. And uh, it's something that is not intuitive and it took a lot of work because spacing, so you're hearing what's in the background but not drowning out who's up front. So that's something to watch too is it's the choreography with that one mic and I invite anyone with their band that's thinking that they want to try it. It's well worth it. it. It takes performing to another level for bluegrass bands. We don't jump off of amplifiers or anything, but we can sure <laughs> we can sure work around them. <laughs> <laughs> but we can show work. Or you'll see the interaction with the mic and the other members of the band, and uh, you'll the movement. I think makes it interesting for the audience. So. I just want to interject that. So. Hey, hey, higher ground. Do you mind if I interject with a? I got a question from the sh the chat box. I wanted to share with you. Sure, go ahead. So, so um, I have a lady. So this has taken it all the way back to to the the earliest days of higher ground. What, um, what or who inspired you to um to form this band and and, and to um and 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 to play. To, to play in a bluegrass band. It, like in the very beginning, that's that's the question. Okay, back to the origins of Higher Ground. I, I started, me personally, I started playing this in 1972 back in uh, Burlington, North Carolina is when I started. Uh, I moved to Albuquerque in July or June of 1995. Uh, started a band of uh, some, just sort of a pickup thing when I got here. I've always been a fan of bluegrass. Um, and then I founded higher ground with Jeff Forbes, who was the original fiddler in the band. And, and the other three original members were Doug Porter on guitar, Ron Lujan uh, on the mandolin, and Mark Smith uh, from Knoxville, Tennessee uh, on the bass. And we formed in, in September of 1998, right after the Santa Fe uh, Old Time Bluegrass Festival. And it was just a happenstance meeting. I had met Jeff at a jam session in Albuquerque. Uh, and I had met Mark at, at a jam session. I had met Ron one time on mandolin and passing at a jam session at Hyde Park up in Santa Fe. Had never met Doug, but Jeff had met Doug. And so we just kind of all got together one time. Uh, I had wanted to start a band when I moved to Albuquerque. I had just left active duty uh, and returning back to civilian life. And then my job brought me here but I wanted to get back into bluegrass, and um, those those uh, that that was the the core of what was the foundation of higher higher ground. Now we didn't that collective. We were together less than a year. Um, we lost Ron uh, about, about eleven months uh, after that unexpectedly. Uh, late, late fall fall of ninety nine. Yeah, fall of ninety nine. We lost Ron unexpectedly, and we asked. Uh, Dave Devlin to join us uh, as part of the band at that time on mandolin and dobro. And then shortly after that, Doug uh, Porter moved away uh, on guitar. So the first iteration of Higher Ground was uh, really just about a year. And when Doug left, Fred, the exceptional rhythm guitarist that he is and vocalist, we brought him in. And, and that, was, Thank you very much. that was pretty <laughs> much the kind of the, uh, from that point, we determine the direction we wanted to go, which was we're gonna, we're gonna do some original or some traditional, but our real focus for those first, I'll say what, almost 10 years was purely original material uh, and, and trying to develop something new. We, we love traditional bluegrass, and, but we also like contemporary and we like progressive uh, and we do a little bit of all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has kind of evolved into the, the higher ground sound. Uh, uh, Laura and Pat joined us, uh, like I said, about 10 years ago. Mark moved up to Utah. We needed a bass player. And then the, the good find was Fred found Pat uh, up at the lab. Wandering through the bushes. Moved in from Monterey, <laughs> California and joined us. We'd been without a fiddler for, oh my gosh, seven years. Uh, and so, you know, having Pat join the band, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not work with this group. Uh, it literally is. It's like brothers. It's, it's, it's labor like a, of love. Truly, it's, it's, a, it's we're a family. Yeah, we love it. Is Laura still smiling while we're saying that? Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't see Laura. She left her chair. She. <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't see empty. her. 
so that's that's i hope that answers the question it's kind of a long answer but uh that's where we started where we came from so but so far i think this this iteration you see now is going to be well, may. nobody's planning on moving i don't think so <laughs> so i think that this will be higher ground for the years to come and uh so far everyone in the band writes laura wrote her tinderbox and uh she was the final cog in the band to uh to find you know the final member to write her song and put her mark on the band yeah everybody in the band has written original material uh for the albums we, like i said we have eight albums our most recent <laughs> one uh we had had it already we released it on december the 29th uh, ready for the festival season coming up this year and uh, it was my second solo project, an album called Auburn Sky, uh, instrumental, Celtic, progressive stuff, uh, all originals. And, uh, of course, we haven't had a festival to, or gig to sell them at yet. So. <laughs> Best laid plans. So kind of back to song arrangement. Uh, yeah, why don't we do a, a little bit of Carolina Moon? And, and I'll talk about this one. Uh, I wish Laura was uh, with us. She sings harmony with me on this. Uh, we do a duet. Uh, it's a song that I wrote in the recording of our 20th anniversary album. Uh, and the arrangement, it's very much, if you, if you think back to the beginning of this workshop, we talked about the song, Make Me a Pallet on Your Floor, where there's really only one section or an A part of the song. And it just repeats over and over and over. This song is along that same vein, written in the lines of uh, Down the Road, the old flattened scrubs, yeah. that pretty little girl of mine lives down, down the road. road. Down it was done in a, in a manner of sing a verse, play a verse, sing a verse, play a verse. So the play a verse kind of essentially becomes a, a, a musical chorus. So this one I wrote uh, along that line, and I wrote it, uh, and it's one measure short, so it's seven measures. Mm -hmm. And the eighth measure is the start of the next measure. So it kind of rolls, keeps rolling over itself. And what's kind of cool about it is uh, we had been playing it. It's on our 20th anniversary album, HGB 2O. And we recorded it and it came out great. And after we had been playing it, we had a, uh, somebody had a suggestion. Well, that, that Ms. We, Bolton. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Bolton, Bolton had, had a, a suggestion. A change. And she I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you'll, she you'll said see it's what it is. It's a great tune, but I think you need to do blah, 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 blah. So you yeah, see it, blah, 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 blah. And it made, just, made something else. Yeah. I hope I remember all the words without Laura here. Here we go. <laughs> One, two, three, go. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that's Carolina, a song called Carolina Moon. Yeah, you can see it's uh, kind of repetitive, uh, uh, but that was the intent. It was done by design. And the, the, the lyrics that go with it are, cover a range of things, things that were kind of near and dear to me growing up in North Carolina. And, and that's where the, the theme of Carolina Moon came from. So the, the, the parts we were missing, obviously, we're missing Laura on the bass and missing Dave on the mandolin. And he and Pat, so since I'm, off, I'm singing a lot on this, <laughs> the whole song, I rely on Pat and Dave to play, and you'll notice in the background, Pat was doing it when I'm singing a verse. He's playing, but he's playing tastefully and quiet and like not that. stepping on me, all right? Uh, and then we had been playing this song, I guess, almost a year, mm -hmm. just not quite how you heard it, uh, as we had recorded it on the album. And Fred White, Fred's wife, Jane, really liked the song, but she said, you know, you need to do something in the middle of it to break it up. Uh, and so we thought about that for a while and we came up with the, the concept of what you heard there. You'll notice after the verse where I talk about going to grab my hat, shine my shoes, get the five string, pick us a tune, two step at the old hold down in the light of a Carolina moon. We changed songs right there. We skipped, uh, pick up, uh, on the downbeat on the one beat mm -hmm. with cripple Creek, yep. an old traditional, uh, fiddle tune that's been around for gosh. Forever. I think it was the second song I ever learned to play on the banjo. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's recognizable. Everybody knows it. Uh, and then there's but there's dynamics involved in that change and the decisions we made. Uh, we go into it, but it's just Pat and I and Dave but playing a trio of instruments for the A part, and then Fred and and Laura start stacking in on the B part. And then we're full up back as a band in the second time through the song. And then we transition right back to the, to the, the, the core form, yeah. of Carolina moon. Right. And then at the end we did a little stop. We were missing our fourth harmony there, Laura, but I know you were singing it there at home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she was singing it. Uh, <laughs> and I nailed, about? I nailed the last part. Uh, nailed right. it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I know you nailed it. The phrase, we'll meet again up yonder, and then we stack the vocals harmony on that. And it, again, it just adds something surprising. Instead of the standard, you know, shave and a haircut, you know, we decided to do something different. Uh, there's nothing wrong with shaving a haircut two bits, but uh, why not do something different? So that's what led us to the arrangement that, uh, that we end up doing on that song. What else, Fred? You got anything else you want to add? Uh, there's a lot of different song styles out there. I talked about the ones that, uh, the different ones we do. Uh, you know, we do the traditional things, uh, traditional tunes. Do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, original, a lot of original. Uh, really enjoy putting those together. Um, progressive. Yeah, we got our progressive tunes as well. Well, you know, the, um, I'd throw out there that the, the uh, songwriting and song craft also enters into this. I mean, it's not, well, it is song arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, and I, I think often about this gospel tune that Duke and I kind of co-wrote together called Ride. And I'd, oh, that's I'd, a good one. Yeah. I'd, well, yeah. I'd had, that's one that I'd had in mind. I had a, a little kernel of a, an idea for about five years that I carried in the back of my head. When I finally started pushing out lyrics to Duke, uh, what I what I thought I was hearing was like a, a fast four four tune, but he and I worked on lyrics back and forth for a couple of weeks, and and uh, and I, I yeah I, you know, I, I was I, remember that. I was up in I was up in my little man cave with 
all the instruments. And, and one of the instruments said to me, make it a three quarter blues tone. Yeah. Do you remember what drove you to that? Cause remember I, I, remember. I, I had uh, taken the lyrics and I had developed a, a melody for it in four, four. Right. And I'd sent it to you and said, here, what do you think? And you came back almost like immediately. Almost immediately. And said, yeah. no, it needs to be three, four. three quarter. Yeah. And, and it was the perfect call very for blues that. Song. Oriented. Well, truly the part that really <coughs> hooked Laura and I was the part where it said bacon. Well, yes. I, I well, think a song that says bacon, you, it's, it's a winner. It well, should have won New Mexico well, Music it's, Award. It's, it's even better than that. I mean. Right, Laura? That's right. What, what tune have you ever heard written where you have both bacon and oblation? <laughs> we should do that one for That's what I was thinking. We should do that we one. We should do that That's one. a fun one. That's a fun song. It's a great song. And it's, a, it's an arrangement. Uh, it is a waltz. It's a gospel tune. Uh, we spent, uh, <coughs> we still play it today the exact way that we originally arranged it because I, yep. I think the arrangement was good. Uh, the banjo has a supporting role in this song. It's predominantly led by Pat and Dave. They take the breaks, the leads, and most of the noodling. And, uh, so I'll be doing that today. Yeah. So. Yep. And, uh, part of, it, part of cool. me will be Dave, and then I'll go back to me. So this is one called Ride. Thanks for your help, dude. One, three, one. <laughs> I gotta remember what's, what's first. Some folks, like some folks, it. some folks seem to think. Okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. So there we go. One, two, one, two three, one, two, three, one. <laughs> Some folks seem to think they were right too strong. Long and simple till their conscience succeeds. What gives them the right to slight justice and weep?
So that's a uh, Fred Bolton, Duke Weddington original called Ride. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. We're just about to the end of our 50 minutes. Uh, right Eric, any other comments, questions? Or? Yeah, yeah, I got a question here. Um, so so I, I, I feel a little guilty. Like I feel like I, I kind of distorted this young lady's uh, question or, earlier. And I, I just I just want to honor this question by, by I just um, quoting it. So what um, the question is, what inspired you to make music? And and if if I'd be so bold, I know there's some young people in the in the audience here, um, like teenagers. And I, I, I wonder if you could speak to them about like what um, you know, like what inspired you to make music at that age, like when you first started out when you were young? I know that's a big question. So you might have to summarize. Okay. Uh, for me, it's hard to say. Uh, my parents were not musicians. Uh, nobody really in my family played. Uh, believe it or not, I started off as a drummer uh, and, uh, at age 10, and that was because a buddy started. Uh, but what really hooked me on the banjo when I was 11, my dad brought home an album from a guy named Don Van Palta, the Flying Dutchman, a tenor banjo player, that he had seen at a, at a conference. He, had, he worked for IBM, and at a conference they had, that was one of the entertainment, and he bought the album and brought it home. And for me, that tenor banjo and the sound of that banjo is what inspired me to pick up the five string and start to learn. Even though it's five and not the tenor style, I was really interested in the five string because of, believe it or not, the Andy Griffith show and the Darlin family. And I just wanted, I had to learn. I used to play as a kid. I practiced the first two years, I, uh, eight hours a day, easy. I would play. I was just, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to learn this. So for me, that's what, that's what started it for me. Pat, what, how about you? Well, I started out, my family was very musical. My uh, mother and father both played keyboard, basically mom piano. My dad was organ and trombone and grew up in the big, you know, during the uh, big band era, they were both uh, World War II vets. And uh, so swing was real big, but then the, uh, my brothers and sisters, everybody played something and uh, from drums to guitars and rock and roll and that type of thing. And my two older brothers still play rock and roll as of this date. They're both drummers, so which is funny. But uh, I started at age seven playing classical violin and uh, I listened, I heard, believe it or not, I heard uh, an Eagles album, one of the very first one, and it was. Uh, um, I think it was uh, Bernie Ledden on the banjo and uh, just it was a five string playing Scruggs rolls and everything else. And I was going, that is awesome. So I wanted to quit violin and start picking up. So I picked up the banjo for a little bit. And uh, But you were cured years later, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was cured when uh, the first band, I answered an ad in the paper, the first band I ever played. And I answered an ad in the paper for a, a uh, fairly competent uh, violinist or bluegrass fiddler. And at the time I truly wasn't either, but I thought, well, I really want to play in a band. So I went over to the uh, the uh, tryout and thought I'd take the banjo player. I could take the banjo player's job, but uh, he was actually very good. So that's kind of started me down the road of bluegrass fiddling and uh, I, uh, realized I didn't know enough about it just from listening to records and that type of thing. So I took private lessons for about a year from a, a guy named Virgil Evans, who was a three-time state uh, California fiddle champ. And uh, he really brought my fiddling into a realm where it was more pleasant to listen to and I could understand how to put things together. And then I just have like Duke, I practiced eight hours a day just listening to records and you know how hard it is to keep finding the place oh, yeah. where you want to keep playing over and over again to try to figure your breaks. I and, remember those days. Yeah. Well, I'd even buy books so you'd have the musical notation because I could read. So uh, that kind of started. I played in a band since I was, uh, believe it or not, I was 18 years old and uh, 
turned 21 playing music in a bar and everybody's going, you're turning 21 <laughs> now? Ever since. Yeah. How about you, Fred? Yeah. So. Well, well, my path was not at all. Like I remember yours. a certain band name, which we can't repeat. Uh, yeah, yeah, Little Freddie and the something. Uh, something yeah, there about. you go. No, I came, I came in, uh, actually, my, my mother uh, insisted that all three of her children have piano lessons and my, my two younger sisters absolutely hated it. But you know, I went through five or six years of piano lessons, sixth through eleventh grade or so. But um, I grew up in in East Tennessee around Oak Ridge, and nobody listened to this stuff. Bluegrass, you know, it was all <laughs> rock and roll. And so, uh, you know, the guys that I was interested in was, uh, you know, Cream and Eric Clapton and stuff like that. Um, but I did borrow a guitar and. Uh, from people for a bit, and, and uh, my dad gave me a Yamaha acoustic for graduation in 1970, my high school. Um, but really, for me, uh, I got to credit Dave a lot because um, after we moved to New Mexico in 83, um, oh, good grief, how old was I then? You know, th early 30s. And um, I had met Dave in about 1990 or 91 at a party up in up in White Rock and uh, saw him at, a, at an outdoor concert and went over and asked him if he was interested in playing. He and I played in our living rooms for like four years before we met Doug Porter. And, and um, you know, that's, that's, that's how I came into this business. Yeah. So. So just an, a love of music, I guess. You know, my dad was big into, he, he had, we had the big old, console size stereo that we had classical yes. albums yeah. music soundtracks 2001 a space Odyssey. he was a, a very eclectic uh taste in music you know sing along with mitch you name it yeah but it was always something was going on music was always playing in the house so and i think that's pretty common for all three of yeah. us common thread there so that's uh that's what we have for you today on song arrangement at least some of the uh, the background, the ideas, the thoughts, and the concepts that uh, go into the decisions that we make, uh, and we, you know, always revisit them from time to time and, and find out there are, are little tweaks and stuff through the years that you can actually uh, apply and still make them better. There's Laura making us making us smile again. There comes the thunder. I By hear the way, thunder. I, I just I want to throw out real quick. Seeing Laura's smile on the on the screen is it just makes me tell you one of the things that, that I love most about Laura. She's always smiling when we're playing. The rest of us look like I don't know, our best. We actually friend are enjoying killed. it. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Laura, and thanks, Eric, and and thanks to everybody there making all this event, all these events today. Happen. Yeah, we appreciate yeah, it. Very check much. us out on the web, highergroundbluegrass.com. Yeah, we'll be back out in public soon. We hope. We certainly hope so. Bye, Laura. Thank you very much, High Ground. Everybody give them a round of applause. Thank you so much.